Hello, and welcome once again to What I Did Next from ANT Media, a show where we explore life's pivot points. I'm Malak Fouad, your host. On this show, our guests delve into their personal and professional crossroads and discuss how they choose which way to go. These are people who are multilingual, multicultural, with roots in the Middle East. They are engaged, curious, and passionate about knowledge, aiming to leave the world a slightly better place. This episode is brought to you by Marrakez, Building Spaces for Life. Marrakez is the leading mixed-use developer in Egypt, with an ever-growing portfolio of commercial and residential projects. Visit www.marrakez.net for more information. To many in Egypt and the wider Middle East, my guest today is well known for his feats of daring and his adventurous spirit. Omar Samra joins me to discuss the roller coaster ride that has been his life so far. He calls himself an introvert, but he had no hesitancy in opening up about his work and his life. He's comfortable sharing what motivates him and talks freely about the twists and turns fate has dealt him. Omar is the first Egyptian to reach the top of Everest. He's climbed the seven summits and he's skied to both the North and South Pole. He is the founder of Wild Guanabana, one of the region's leading adventure travel companies. In 2017, along with his friend Omar Noor, Omar took up a maritime challenge that ended in disaster. The pair were attempting to become the first Egyptians to row across the Atlantic, but after just a thousand kilometers, their two-man boat capsized in a storm and they had to be rescued. In undertaking this challenge, the two men wanted to highlight the plight of refugees who were crossing dangerous waters in order to seek a better life elsewhere. The journey has become the subject of a documentary called Beyond the Raging Sea, which has garnered rave reviews at various film festivals. We're kicking off the episode with one of the show's staple questions about the movies, books, and music that inspire Omar. There's so many things that come to mind. Um, and um, with the movie, I decided to go with something a bit more lighter. So, well, it's not really light, but it's lighter than other things that I could have picked was with um, Christopher Nolan's um, Batman trilogy. Uh, just because, you know, growing up, I was, I've been always such a huge fan of, you know, the the uh, the Marvel universe and and the, and and DC comics and just superheroes in general. Was it uh, difficult for you to pick Batman versus one of the other superheroes? No, I mean there there are other there are other yeah there are other um, superheroes that I might uh, identify with mm-hmm. more, for example. But uh, no, it's just because the film is just so brilliantly done. I I didn't really like that you know most of the superhero films are always sort of just very kind of action oriented yeah. really lowest common denominator type right. film whereas you know when you read the comics and when you're young and you get into that universe you realize actually that you know these are very complex uh, characters very troubled characters they're always uh, you know pulled in different directions and i think that christopher Nolan did an amazing job of bringing that out and are you much of a reader yes what sort of books do you like i haven't read as much as i'd like to in the last few years i think my, that's everyone's uh, yeah everyone's story when i was really big in my mountaineering phase i read a lot of mountaineering literature so basically people talking about their expeditions from you know old expeditions in the 1800s and early 1900s and so on so very much exploratory kind of expeditions when people were not necessarily all the time trying to summit a mountain but trying to do reconnaissance trying to find what the best route is to climb a mountain so this whole idea of the unknown um i've read a lot into there was another phase of my life when i read a lot into spirituality um you know different religions and 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 ways of life and obviously my travels took me from the far east to the other sides of the world so i was very much exposed to that and i got to a chance to live with different people with different convictions and everything that was really interesting to me but also the, uh, the spirituality also from the more esoteric kind of standpoint uh, medicinal plants and uh, you know all kinds of different things yeah. I, read, I read about so much yeah and i would tend to read about things before i ever like um embarked on maybe um trying an experience for myself or living a, an experience for myself that was my my gateway i read a lot of fiction what kind of fiction do you like the the book actually that i that i put down was a book called uh, the dice man uh-huh. the book is about a uh, um, a psychologist who practices traditional psychology and starts to get frustrated with his own life and the fact that he doesn't know what he's doing as a way of getting himself out of it he decides to run his own social experiment and the experiment is what if i what if i took out like human character and volition 
And basically every decision that I made was dictated by the dice. So I became a completely random person. So he starts this first with very small things. Like, am I going to have the, the steak dinner? Or am I going to have this? Am I going to eat out? Or am I going to do this? Am I going? Eventually he becomes, he gets so captivated by this. He goes to a dinner party and, you know, if he rolls a one, he's going to be, a, you know, a Catholic priest. If it's number two, he's going to be like, I don't know, this and that. <laughs> so he creates personas for himself. So then he starts to create personas to the point that he actually loses his own identity. Wow. Does not really, uh, does not, can't even relate to who he actually is and doesn't know who he actually is. Eventually, he creates something called the Dice House, which is almost a commune of people living by the dice. The book was so prolific that actually people went out and create, bought properties in places and turned them into Dice Houses. Wow. Um, and no one really knew who the, the author is because he, he, he authored the book under an alias. Uh, when did you read that? How old were you? Were you in your teens 20s. or later? In your 20s. Yeah. Okay, so you could understand it as an adult, not as an impressionable... Yes, I understood it as an adult and I think, uh, you know, I probably read it when I was still in my investment banking days and obviously I, I struggled with that because I didn't have a sense of freedom. Yeah, that's really interesting. Because my life had, come, had become a quite repetitive at that point. What about music? Music is very much part of my world, but I, I feel that my music taste has stopped in time. I think all of us. Somewhere in the 90s or in the early <laughs> 2000s. I was very much growing up. I was fascinated with uh, with rap, and I'm talking mm -hmm. like old school rap, you know, from the days of NWA all yeah. the way to. Um, so that was something that was that was a really big thing, and that was very much your youth, your generation. Growing up, yes, um, and then the other thing was like alternative rock, um, you know, so bands like Dave Matthews and. And then obviously the Bob Dylans of this world, sure. it's more folk and, and stuff like that. I went to a lot of concerts and things like that. And so when I listen to music uh, in the car or listen to music at home and so on and so forth, it's, it's mostly those things yeah. that I used to listen to yeah. 10, 15 years ago. Sure. And, um, and the song that I picked actually um, as a favorite, although it's very difficult to pick a favorite, was um, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay by Otis Redding. You know, whenever I think of that song, it conjures a specific image um, when I was on my one year trip traveling around the world, um, which I, when I, you know, quit my banking job temporarily for to, to do, uh, and I was, um, in Nicaragua, there was a certain view there that just sticks in my head of how the, you know, how the lake looked with the, there was a, there's an island in the lake that has two volcanoes, the islands of Metepe. And I was about to go the next day and try to climb one of those volcanoes. When I almost got to the top, I realized that it was a semi-active volcano and there was smoke coming out through the ground. Wow. I, at that point, I felt that my boots were a little bit hot and I looked and, I, and it had melted the rubber of my soles to the point that there was a hole um, in the ground. So I kind of touched the, the summit very quickly and, and, and ran down. And went back down. <laughs> but I remember listening to that song uh, on loop. to climb the Swiss Alps at the age of 16. Yes. Now, what makes a boy from Cairo do that? So actually, I was in a... Uh, my parents had sent me to a summer camp in Switzerland. It was close to... It was in Lausanne. In the, in the, on the weekends, you would have to pick between things to do. You know, I'd never seen snow. I'd never climbed the mountain. For some reason, I just had this idea that that's something that I'm never, ever going to get a chance to do. So let me just give it a go. And uh, it was sort of like the, it was just the, the beginning. And as soon as I stepped into the mountains, I, I felt something, something almost uh, familiar, uh, even though I had, it was a very alien kind of place to me. And um, at that time, I had overcame my asthma and so on. So I was actually in very good shape. And you, were, you had asthma as a child yeah, all I your had life? A child, uh, as a child, I, I would imagine probably I was diagnosed when I was 11, but I was probably struggling with it from the age of six or seven. Um, and then I went through a, an amazing experience with a, with a coach who everyone was like, no, no, don't do, don't do too much exercise. You're going to exhaust yourself. You're going to be. And he was the first person to tell my parents, no, he actually has to do the opposite to be able. But that's pretty impressive that your parents did that and they went against the grain and took his advice. Yeah, I think that they were also like, I mean, they didn't really know what to do. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think I, I'd been kind of left out of a lot of opportunities. Do you think the, the attraction for you of extreme sort of sport, adventure could be a reaction to that? Could be a reaction to feeling frail as a child? I think so. I mean, definitely climbing Mount Everest, I think there was, a, there was definitely a big part of it was proving something to myself. And I think climbing a mountain like Everest where there was very little oxygen seemed to be the epitome of a challenge for somebody who couldn't breathe very well. And uh, Did you have to take extra precautions? 
I on didn't. The time? I mean, by, by the time I went to Everest, I had, I, you know, the, the asthma was was something that was in in the past. It right. was not something that I was struggling with anymore. Um, you know, after I started training with that guy, it was only a few months after that I stopped using the inhalers. Um, I started becoming, you know, so uh, fit on a sort of a cardiovascular level that all my friends would say like, you know, Omar Dalima bit is the guy who never gets tired. Yeah, yeah. So that was like a just to be known as that in school. From having been the guy who was always never picked because you know he was there must always, have been a lot of proud pride for you in that. There was a lot of pride, and it was a, it was an actual moment because I I ran the the school sports day um, when I was about ten or eleven years old, and uh, it was eight people running the eight hundred meter race, and I came seventh out of eight, and I even walked into the finish line. I was just so like you know exhausted. But and, it's great you took part. That you actually did it to yeah. begin with. Um, but but then it was it was as a as a child of that age it was kind of embarrassing, right? Like, right. At of least course. in my head, you know, people may have not thought much about it. But but it was probably in your head more than anything else. I'm sure no one. Yeah, realized. of course, yeah. of course. But yeah. obviously, like these little when you're that young, when these little things become like everything, and uh, and then I and then I met that coach and I went through this thing. So a year later, I managed to convince the school for to run the same race again. It wasn't easy because I did so badly the last year. And so in that year, there was some issue with the logistics. And so they had to make us run with the seniors who were, we were now age 11, 12, and the seniors had hit puberty. So they were now all of a sudden like men, bigger, bigger, you much know, bigger, young men and so on. And I came first. Wow. And I, I really crushed that race. I mean, I, I managed, I, I beat the second guy by probably like 30 meters or so, like in the, in the final stretch. And uh, for me, that was a huge turning point in my life because it was the first time I realized that if I work hard at something, I can change the cards I'm dealt in life. And that's something that I've learned then. And it's a great, super valuable lesson to learn at such a young age. So this is, we could consider this your first major pivot in life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, yeah. and to do it at a time when obviously in our culture, like until you, you know, you leave the house, that for some people it's when they get married, other people that's yeah. when they go to university. But to be still very much in a child kind of phase, you know, obviously if I, if I hadn't done that, and on and at 16, I would have went to that mountain in Switzerland. I don't think coming back down the mountain, I the first thought that would have come to my head is, I want to climb the highest mountain in the world. You know, I find you know a lot of people struggle with um, just sort of dreaming big and and setting a goal. And and the thing is, like you know, because it was always never okay. What can I achieve? It was just what really you know, sparked my imagination, what really like I was so passionate about. And then it was like, okay, then commit to that thing and then figure out how you're going to do it. I think a lot of people think big, but they're not able to implement it or commit to it. Yeah. You know, they don't. I think it's the starting thing. I mean, I, yeah. I've always realized that, I mean, even when you, you know, when you look at a mountain, when you're walking, you know, sometimes you have to walk several days to reach a mountain to climb it. When you're looking at the mountain, the mountain always looks extremely daunting, you know, from a distance. You know, once you once you get to the foot of the mountain, then you start the detail starts to appear, and then you realize, well, listen, there's this nook here, and there's this cranny there, and there's this. Yeah, and you deal with what you can see right there. Yeah. So considering you you had this um, this concept of you liked to climb, and you 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 had gone as a sixteen year old to Switzerland, what made you begin your your career in investment banking? Was it just you felt it was the natural progression from your degree? You were at AUC, right? I was at AUC. Yeah. I only picked engineering initially just because the queue was shorter. <laughs> and uh, and so it wasn't really a very smart way of going about it. So obviously a year and a half later, I switched into economics. I switched to economics because it was the the major that I where I would lose the least amount of credits. I really had no idea of what I wanted to do in life. Um, and which is which is interesting because a lot of people always have the misconception that I've always known what I wanted just because of, you know, the whole Everest story and everything else. When it came to the career fair, everybody was, you know, really preparing for it and so on and so forth. And I was, I couldn't be less interested in all the opportunities that were there. And then eventually I saw a booth for HSBC Investment Bank and they were recruiting for a job in London. So I was like, I don't really know what investment banking is. I don't know if it's something you really want to do, but I know definitely that I would love to live in London, love to live abroad. Um, I hold a UK passport as well as my Egyptian. A couple of weeks later, I got a phone call 
saying that they wanted to organize an interview. I went into the interview. I didn't have a suit, anything. Borrowed, you know, got a suit, borrowed a tie from my dad. <laughs> uh, it was ridiculous because I, I borrowed this like really loud uh, Versace <laughs> tie worth the thing. I don't know what they were. Not about. your look. I would love to know what they were thinking. Yeah. And then eventually I got I got the call. And you you and went into a job. bit uh, an an industry that you had no clue about. But to be very honest, you know, after six months of working, which I was very exciting six months because it was new, I was living alone. Now I could afford to, you know, rent a really nice flat in London with some flatmates and travel and, and climb because, you know, I and did this experience when time. I was 16, but my parents wouldn't have it to right. send me to go climb again. So you kept doing that like on vacations, weekends, you'd fly out to Europe and climb and yes. stuff like that? Yes. And then eventually, I, you know, eventually two years later, I quit. That's a really hard decision to take because you were young. Yeah, I was 23. And you're supposed to be in a conventional format. You're meant to be at the beginning of a career and and a very uh, promising career, actually. How did it feel for you? Was it a leap of faith? Yes, very much so. So when, when I started banking, I, I spent six months, you know, really kind of in the, in the height of it because it was very new and I was just like living that high. And then after six months, the, the, the monotony and drudgery of like what I the life I was living the sort of you know stuck behind the desk all the time just kind of you know wishing the week away just for the weekend and then another thing and I just felt like my life was slipping did you feel you were too young to have that lifestyle it wasn't like too young it wasn't like ah, oh, this, this should be my life when I'm older yeah. it was just like this is not really the it's life I intended wanted. for myself yeah. at all at any point yeah. in, in time I did have a friend called Dennis Dennis O'Connor um, who actually later on quit investment banking to become a, a policeman and then a detective. It's interesting. I, I love these stories of people who, who start in one thing and end up in yeah. something completely different. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. And he, he was the most adventurous person that I knew at the time. He was with you at the bank? He was me at the bank. Yeah. Yeah, we were good friends. He, he had done this amazing cycling trip from Nice to Naples. And I remember when he talked, we used to go every week or every other week, we used to go for lunch. And we used to always talk about a lot of things we talk about women obviously we talk about our work but mainly we talk about how one day we're going to quit our jobs and travel the world um, and then he told me about this trip he'd done and i was like next week you got to bring the maps bring the stuff and i want to hear all about it and i just remember being so fascinated and it was the first time you know other than the climb that i did when i was 16 when i was listening to something and i was like that's what i want to do with my life but it was like, that's not even a job. Yeah. It's not like today when you can be like a travel influencer and get course, paid to travel the world. Course. It was like a very different time. Not that I would want to do that either, but, but, I, but it was just not even possible. Um, but it, I, couldn't, I couldn't help. So I told him, you should walk back to the bank together. I was like, you know, you go ahead. I went to, to a bookstore. I stood where... Um, the travel section. This travel section where there's a bunch of maps. And so I closed my eyes and I scanned this and I just picked out a map and it was the map of Andalusia, the south of Spain. Um, so I went back to work and as soon as I saw my boss, I applied for a holiday like three months later in the summer. Surely enough, a few months later, I was on a bicycle by myself, uh, starting from Sevilla, going all the way to Cadiz, down to Tarifa, crossing with a ferry to Gibraltar. And that trip, when I came back from this trip, it was the most freedom, most happiness most joy i've ever experienced in my life and to experience that level of joy completely by myself not dependent on other people around me for me was such an, a crazy notion and when i came back to the bank i could feel the weight you you and you, you, i knew you then i have to plan my exit so i want to change gears a little bit what our listeners might be really interested in is the um the actual trip you did across the atlantic with omar noor i've heard you speak about this before and it was an extremely moving story and a very scary story now that you have a bit of distance from it how does it fit into your mindset compared to what you had done before maybe you can just walk us through briefly the trip itself yeah. and what you were trying to achieve with it and then what what went wrong i mean well first of all i mean i had I, I knew from day one that i was not going to do this myself i don't have a maritime experience and when something if something goes wrong i i want to have someone with me i'm glad that i that i decided to do that omar noor is somebody that i that i had known i didn't know him as for instance as well as muhammad who i'd known for like you mm. know 30 more years i had known him for like just uh, you know would uh, you say he knows you better than anyone at this point in some situations in some sense he probably knows me more than anybody right. because we were, and same for me. I mean, we, we, we went through an experience that is just, I mean, the, I would say that the movie probably 
underplays what we went through. It was such a, you know, it's a challenging, but such a sort of a rewarding experience training. We went from both of us from being endurance athletes to training our bodies to completely convert our bodies to be, you know, very strong. Like more, it was more about muscle endurance and 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 strength because you had to. In one oar stroke, you had to displace as much water as you could, but also you had to do that motion 12 hours a day, every day. And conserve energy, presumably as much as you could. Conserve energy. There was so much uh, just, you know, battling with nausea, battling with sleep deprivation, cold, just the salt would just, you know, would, would, would create like lots of sores on your bum and all kinds of, you know, things that you wouldn't think about. So when I signed up to these things, I had this very romanticized notion of like two men you know, alone Too in the ocean, in boat. battling the yeah. elements, you know. We were supposed to get to Antigua in the Caribbean. And we, we set sail from San Sebastián La Gomera, which is a island Canary. in the Canaries. Those 12 days before we set off, which ended up being 14 because the race got delayed a couple of days, we got so intimate with the boat. You know, the boat obviously is, is called Jan. Every boat has a name. So And you had to keep packing it and unpacking it and getting used to the, the, the supplies and all of this kind of thing, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you knew every little nook yeah. and cranny in the boat. So you hit bad weather into what, a week into the trip? I mean, we hit bad weather right the from beginning. the start. But the, 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 the bad weather from the start was more that there was no wind. But the danger point was when you... That was day eight. Day eight. Yeah, we started uh, We started hitting really bad, really big weather. Actually, we perceived it as this is great news because now we're finally moving. But you you, you came across a, a, a confluence of, of bad luck because yeah. your boat was meant to self-right, wasn't it? Yeah, the boat was meant to self-right. It had been tested yeah. and it did self-right in, in testing. The the life raft is designed for one purpose alone, which is to inflate yeah. in a situation. You can have a life raft and own it for 20 years and never use it. Um, and the, 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 obviously the life raft was sent to be checked. It was stamped and everything, and it was repacked and all of it. And then when you needed it, it didn't inflate, right? It, it didn't inflate. Yeah. And so that was a lot of things that went wrong and, yeah. until something went right. And then the rescue by the huge tanker or the huge ship, right? Yeah. Which... You had a lot of aborted attempts. They had a lot of aborted attempts to try and rescue you. The story is is literally something out of... It's a fiction yeah. story, actually. Um, I saw the trailer of the film, and it was uh, it's very powerful. The plan was it for it to be released uh, April 2020. Um, it already it already um, screened in four film festivals. Then, then obviously COVID yeah. happened. Um, and now we're still you know trying to figure out what's the best way to, to release it. I'm very proud of the film. Um, the, the artistic journey of making the film um, was a real testament to the director because our film, we didn't have much footage. We had some, but a lot of it, most of it sank with the, with oh, the really? board. So, and everything you see in the film is something that is actually real footage. It's mm -hmm. not, there's nothing mm -hmm. that's been, yeah. you know, there's no reenactments re or anything like that. And that was a conscious choice that we made. Mm -hmm. I think the director did a phenomenal job in in posing me and Omar, um, you know, at different ends of the spectrum. I think I'm pretty much Mr. Doom and Gloom in the in the <laughs> film and, and, and so on. And it was really interesting because Omar is much more animated than me in in any in a, just on a normal day. Yeah. Um, we found out afterwards that the director told Omar to be completely himself and film them at a wide angle so he can get all of his hand gestures. And then, you know, film me. I also use my hands a lot. Film me very up close and told me to to kind of, in a way, cued me to to be even more subdued than I usually are. So that created a huge, even more The contrast, contrast was very visible. Which actually played very well in the film. It works. It gives it a dramatic effect. Yeah. And we, we when we when we set out to, 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 to do the trip, we wanted to row across the ocean. And I had convinced Omar to do it, obviously, and so on. Um, now that we were... We were, you know, firmly going, and we had a sponsor and so on. Um, I was very much convinced that we had to attribute it to a cause, and I felt very strongly about the plight of refugees back then. It was in the news all of the time, and still very little was being done. Now, people are still showing up on these shores, but it's, Off the it's, never, it's never on the news anymore. It's not on the front page, um, and, and it's a, it's a sad situation. As in some countries, it's been criminalized. And so I think that I think there hasn't been a more um, you know important time actually to to release uh, the yeah. film. But in some ways, you feel the world has moved on from that. But it's still, I believe it's one of the most important. Um, I think it's still going to be an ongoing issue, yeah. and especially from where our perspective in Egypt, where this whole area, the region is is you know has a lot of issues with this. Yes, absolutely.
Would you consider this trip, the the rescue and and the fact that you you know it was very perilous for you, was was that a pivot in, for you in some way, or yes. did you do you just add it up to experience and yalla let's keep going? No, it's definitely a pivotal moment in my life. Like I you know I I think to come so close to death to the point where I was for a moment I completely gave up, uh, you know, and I was about to just you know basically just uh, you know not end my life but just by doing nothing i would have just it would have been a few minutes and it would that would be the end of it so one of the things is i i wasn't sure whether this experience would leave me you know um it hasn't left me scarred in that way i i believe that we we were so unlucky that the chances of something like that happen so many things going wrong in that same way is is almost negligible um but i think it's given me much more of an appreciation for for life i remember omar and i were on such a high for so many months after nothing could affect us nothing could bring us down it's like when people survive a plane crash they feel they're invincible yeah it's that feeling i yeah. guess nobody other than omar would be able to truly understand what we went through uh that brought us really close um and i just feel really blessed i can't really say for sure if i'll never attempt this again mm -hmm. um uh, but but definitely i feel um the story it was the best conclusion to the story having gone through this experience and survived it you know if our objective was to shed light on the plight of refugees i think they you know i think this is probably the best know, outcome in a way the best outcome in a way you know we could have crossed the ocean got to the other side but what we went through in terms of a formative experience probably outweighs had we succeeded and, yeah. and made it. I heard an interview that you gave you said that you hated adrenaline rushes. Yeah. And I find that really fascinating yeah. considering what it is you do. Yeah. I mean it confuses a lot of people but I, the way I describe it, adrenaline I believe are like you know activities or sports or whatever where you are doing things at quite a lot of speed um when you have to make split second um decisions or sometimes you are not in control at all so you know things are just happening and you're But you have been in that situation with the Atlantic crossing Yeah I would I mean there was obviously a lot of adrenaline pumping through my body yeah. that day during the survival effort but but um in the actual um you know mission of you know rowing across the Atlantic climbing a big mountain and stuff no these are very deliberate they they're more like pursuits of of mental and physical endurance of like battling the elements and so on and so forth um i wouldn't you know i've done some things but i wouldn't enjoy like being a skydiver or right. doing bungee jumping so that's not what you're chasing it feels to me very much like instant gratification i understand obviously that at the at the very high end of these things there are people who go through an insane amount of uh training and tutelage to get to these things and i admire that a lot but it's not really for me like i i really i very much like things that uh, things that are like hard earned. So let's go back to uh, one of our other questions uh looking at the ideal dinner party for you. Who would be your ideal five or six guests and in what sort of setting would you have them? I kind of would love to think that they would all get along and it would make an interesting dinner conversation, but I I've mainly picked them because I think each person is fascinating in their own right. First I picked Ernst Shackleton. who's um is a renowned sort of uh, british uh, explorer was famed for um the endurance which was an expedition to antarctica at, at that point the south pole had not been reached and he took a team of people across to the antarctic ice shelf they got stuck in the ice shelf for over a year and then he eventually took a small boat um uh, rowed it to a nearby island um brought help and came back and never lost uh, they didn't lose any any one of their crew members so for survival and just you know and um and just sort of team leadership um Shackleton is always somebody who fascinated me when did he do that early early uh, 20th century okay. um the second person would be uh, Edmund Hillary who's obviously one of the first two people to climb Mount Everest but not really for the obvious reason of being the first mm -hmm. person to summit Mount Everest but because of what he did afterwards So when you read his book which recounts the story of climbing Mount Everest there's basically just one chapter dedicated to the climb and then the rest of the entire book is basically his life post Everest of building schools all across the communities of Nepal and how he 
um, you know, change and help the communities there, which he regards as his legacy and not the climb itself. It's almost as if the, the climb of Everest was the introduction to Nepal for him. Yeah. And I do relate to that in some sense. You know, climbing Mount Everest for me was almost a rite of passage that gave me a platform to do so many things that I hadn't, wouldn't have been able to achieve otherwise. Um, Albert Einstein, um, not just because obviously he's a renowned scientist and, a, and a, one of the geniuses of, of our time, but uh, because he's also a, a philosopher. Um, and I'm always really fascinated with his, his quotes that are usually, if you just, if you, if the quotes are read out to you, you would never think that it's coming from Albert Einstein because usually they are very much, uh, practical things about life, things about uh, philosophy of life and so on. The, uh, number four would be uh, Sir David Attenborough. Mm -hmm. Um, he's probably the only person in the world that I can think of that I would trade my life for his in a heartbeat. Have you ever met him? I've never met him. I've been a fan of his work since he was much younger. The, the sheer magnitude of the experiences that he's lived, the places that he's been, the people he's encountered, and the manner that is, in which he's done it is just really awe-inspiring. So, and his whole career is finally being vindicated. Yes. Him and Prince Charles. Yes. Right? And they're finally paying attention. So actually, I was, I was just chosen as an ambassador for the Earth Prize, the Earthshot Prize, which is um, an initiative by the Prince of William, the Duke of Cambridge, um, which basically for the next decade, every year, four uh, prizes will be given for breakthroughs to solve um, climate uh, crisis. And uh, I was very, uh, the closest I've sort of come to being in the, in the sphere of the, Sir David Attenborough is he's one of the judges. Interesting. Um, number five, Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Uh, in my mind, he's the best comedian yeah, of all time. I have a lot of comedian, you know, comic favorites like Seinfeld, yeah. um, you know, people like that, Larry David and so on and so forth, who, who would also actually, Larry David would be really interesting in a, in a, in a dinner table. But uh, Dave Chappelle is just, uh, you would want someone with, with, the, with the four people that I just mentioned, you would want somebody who swears a lot as well. And I think you need to lighten it up a little bit, right? Yeah, you yeah. need to lighten up the, the conversation and have a little bit of, uh, of fun there as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just the comedy. I think he's, uh, he's somebody that matured uh, in, a, in, a, in a really remarkable way. So he's always been this super funny comedian, but he obviously disappeared for a while and came back. Um, came back quite a bit more cynical, which you always want to have in a, in a comic. Uh, and at the same time, just not afraid to just put it all out there. Mm -hmm. um, and then Elon Musk, because um, uh, not just because of not because he's the richest man on earth or or whatever, but I, but somebody who's a, I think is a is a futurist, and uh, I also have a theory that he that he might be an alien. So. Um, <laughs> Having a bit of extraterrestrial blood on the dinner table might that would be really interesting. He's also a pioneer and, and it's kind of fearless, right? He doesn't he doesn't really care what people think. He just goes yeah. for it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he is in a he's in a privileged position to be able to do so, uh, but I think he's done that very from very early on in his career, and he's somebody who's willing to bet the house all the time. But most of the innovators and the groundbreakers are ready to to put everything on the table, aren't they? You I think, think so. of people like Branson and Steve Jobs, and they just just go for it. They don't really think of the consequences. Yeah, I think I think that's part of it, and I think it's also because these people are not primarily driven by the money, and so for them, the alternative of not doing the thing that they have in mind is what like they just plod along. Yeah. So you have no women on your list. Yeah. So I was thinking of that as I was I yeah. was putting it down, I, and I'm obviously like a, you know big advocate for women's rights and so on. So I was kind of, you know, bewildered as I was putting this list. Yeah, no women's this rights. is a good uh, uh, Middle Eastern uh, dinner, only men. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I thought, I thought, as I was thinking this, I rationalized it to myself that, uh, you know, it's sometimes nice to have the boys, you know, right. over, over. So it's a boys night out. So it's a boys night out. And, um, and then the other thing, it's, it's probably a testament to the fact that, you know, a lot of the brilliant uh, women out there are not getting as much airtime as they should or getting as much media coverage as they should. Because I'm pretty sure in, in all of these realms, there will be a woman that would stand sort of shoulder to shoulder. But, uh, you know, it's... They... Well, I think also your first two choices are, you know, people who went on expeditions. And certainly at that time, there were no women yes. doing that. Uh, if, if, I had to, uh, if I had to pick someone... Uh, I, mean, I mean, now that I've picked the six, if mm. I had to add someone, I would um, I would go for 
um, uh, Jane Goodall. Oh yeah, of course. I thought about Jane Goodall as I was yeah. talking, but just I just David Attenborough for me is just a, a childhood hero. Uh, but if I think about her life, and you know, just leaving society as we know it, just spending you know an extended period of time living with chimpanzees, changing the way we think about primates. Yeah, she's a she's a groundbreaker, very much so. Yeah, and she's always obviously someone that's lived her life you know, under her own terms, which I think applies to, to all of these people, you know, to, uh, you know, in my, to my own extent of how I can, it's always something that's been very important to me. It's a lot of people's actually aspiration is to know exactly where you're going to be in three, five and 10 years. That just would scare the living like daylights mm-hmm. out of me. Um, I'd like to live a life where I don't know what's happening around the corner. So you must be feeling very comfortable in the pandemic. I mean, now we're, we're literally, uh, we don't know when is it ending, yeah. what's happening. I've do you struggled. find that I mean, comfortable or do you find that a little bit um, uncomfortable? I find it uncomfortable just like I think everybody would, but I, I would wager that I find it you know, more comfortable than most or less uncomfortable than, than most. You've you know. probably been through situations that have called for... Uh, you to to delve deep into a lot of reserves. Yes. Um, and so what we're going through now, in a way, is is kind of coasting a little bit for you, I guess. I guess it would be coasting if if uh, if I hadn't uh, had such a bad, uh, difficult uh, bout of it. Um, obviously, there are people who've had it far worse than I have. I work mostly in tourism. I mean, I work in the outdoor industry, adventure travel. I'm, I'm also. A, involved in projects that are, you know, a children's charity, some stuff to do with education and so on. But I would say by and large, 80 to 90% of my work was directly affected in a very big way. Um, in the summer, I lost both my sisters uh, to COVID-19. That was, you know, obviously one of the most difficult experiences of my life. They and were younger, they were younger than they, you? They're older than Older me. than you. Yeah. You know, in my view, there was a bit of uh, injustice to that. There, you know, in you know, I don't think they would have fared um, as badly had they had they not been special needs. Of course. Um, so there was a lot. There was a lot to take in. I um, my daughter is seven and a half years old. Just this year was the first time that I take full custody of my daughter in terms of she's spending most of her time with me. It's been a process that I've been working on since my wife's passing. So as much as that has been an, an amazing blessing to have her all the time. Um, it's an adjustment. It's of an course. adjustment, of and course. obviously, being a single father, being a single father in a country that doesn't necessarily, you know, really. I mean, even you know, single mothers struggle a lot in in our society. Well, single fathers is just not really. It's heard not of understood as, as, a, as a concept. Absolutely. Uh, my girlfriend as well. Uh, at the end of last year, went through. Uh, a couple of losses of her grandparents and so on. And so there's, there's been so many changes. A lot of, yeah, a lot of um, difficulties. So, but I would still maintain that had I not get, gone through all of these experiences in my life that have, where I put under a lot of duress and, 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 and stuff and gotten out on the other side, I wouldn't have been able maybe to deal with it as, uh, of as, course. as much as it's I It's made I you more resilient. Yes. Uh, Omar, do you mind if we uh, switch tacks a little sure. bit? Um, I wanted to ask you about your wife, if yeah. that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, how did you meet? We met um, actually because of um, Wild Guanabana, because of mountains and more specifically Kilimanjaro. We were running a trip in 2010 called The Right to Climb, which was a, a group. We had wanted to get, take a group up to the summit of uh, Kilimanjaro and use that experience to raise money for the Right to Live Association, which is uh, my mother's uh, charity. Mm-hmm for special needs. Uh, Marwa's half-sister um, has um, special needs. And so she was sort of connected to that from, from that. I think she was sitting on the toilet reading GMAG, an article in mm. it about Wild Guanabna, this new company that started and so mm-hmm. on. So she read it and there was a bit about me. So she, she got in touch. And that first conversation lasted more than an hour. Mm. Um, and then we ended up uh, meeting and you know going through the whole sort of preparation phase. So she wanted to join the trip. The majority trip. She ended up. She ended up actually joining the trip. The trip ended up being twenty five people. All twenty five people summited. We raised more than a million pounds for charity. It was a real, uh, really great um, mm. experience. It wasn't long before then, probably six months after that, I that I proposed. So you got married quite quickly. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, she passed away with the birth of your daughter. Is that correct? Yes. 
Um, Marwa had went to Miami where this was, where the baby was going to be born there. Born, and I joined her from Alaska to Miami. We spent some time together, and within within two, you know, two and a half weeks, just everything completely changed. I mean, she was in very per- she was in perfect health. There was no warning signs right. that she passed. I see. And and how have you dealt with all of that and managed? Uh, you know, it, it obviously it's a, it was a massive shock for you. You hadn't been married long either. Yeah, I mean, we we uh, she passed away in twenty thirteen. I mean, we'd known each other for like three years. Yeah. We married two of them. Mm. Um, we, we we did so much together in that short time, and I you know the 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 manner that it happened so sudden and um, you know I was rushed into the intensive care unit. Um, she was she was she was taken into the intensive care unit after she got a seizure and. So I was on the sitting there, like you know, like uh, close to her, where her head was, like on the, in on the bed, while the doctors were trying to resuscitate her several times and everything. And that must uh, have been extremely painful for you. It's a very, 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 very painful thing. And I, when I walked out, you know, out of the intensive care unit, there was her twin sister, my sister-in-law was there, and, and her father. You know, it was too difficult for them to go in, so they stayed outside, and I, it's just. Um, there are no words for that. My my life, I think, just completely stopped at that point. I mean, I was, um, Marwa was working with me in the company. So it's not that, you know, when I collapsed, it wasn't just that I personally as an individual collapsed. You know, everything that I've been working on since 2009, uh, the company was four years old, collapsed. And that was basically like, you know, my livelihood. Over on top of that, you know, my 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 in-laws had a different vision of how Tila should be raised and with who and so on and so forth. And the custody laws in Egypt are do not necessarily favor the father. And so you don't really have much choice in, in that. So it was a huge adjustment in my life, like, you know, losing the love of my life. You know, you your daughter is born. But when it's a very bittersweet moment because you have sweet, a child, yeah. but and you, you really have no no desire to keep yeah. on going. Yeah. I mean, how has her passing impacted you in, in your life since then? How have you assimilated it? I mean, it, it threw initially, like, you know, for a while, it threw my, my, my life into a, like a tailspin. Um, it's, um, it's definitely, for some years, you know, was a very difficult thing to get around in terms of trust, being in a relationship, um, allowing myself to, you know, to, to feel for someone. It just felt like that, um, you know, that uh, I guess, you know, subconsciously I didn't want to, you know, do that because I, I had been in a situation where I'd been for many years not really committing to anyone, not really being in a relationship, not being this and that. And and it almost felt like the first time that I allowed myself to really trust and to like fall in love with someone and to and to do that, like it's almost like it was just all taken away from me really um, in a really kind of mean way and so I, it was very very difficult to to trust and and yeah. to understand why yeah. yeah and to also like you know with everything going on with my daughter and everything it was it was very difficult mm. in the beginning to to get out of the feeling of like you know why me why do i des- why do i deserve this you know like why am i being put yeah. through so much of course it just seems so like uh, you know just just so unfair 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 surprisingly though like you know from 2013 to 2018 is you know some of my life's greatest achievements in terms of like adventure and and you know developing a name for myself and everything like that so it's do you feel in a way that she was pushing you she was almost like your angel on your shoulder telling you go go i always knew that um that I, you know the, the when i at the time when i was at my lowest when i didn't it's not like i wanted to take my own life i just didn't care what became of me so i was just very like blase about everything um and the only thing that i really cared about at the time was just to to make her proud it was the motivation for starting the charity after in her name the I, toy charity yeah which was called uh, cairo toy run for orphanages it was just a, an initiative that she'd started which she had started it herself it was just an initiative yeah. a thing that she did collecting toys and, yes. and delivering them you know collecting toys from family and friends and delivering them to deserving charities and 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 orphanages and staying with the kids and playing with them and so on 
which then I renamed Mara Fates Torah and actually registered as a charity. And actually the charity is what brought me back to life because I was, I was you know, in a situation where I was going to work, trying to resuscitate the business, but I would spend the entire day getting like five minutes of work done. And once I started working on the charity, all of a sudden I was putting like all nighters and like super long days and everything. You were motivated. I was motivated. And then once I got the charity to a position where I could hire like a, a part-time person and share the load a little bit, and it was sort of on slightly on the path i started saying you know where did i leave what, what was le- you know like when i i did the seven summit what was that person that omar that had summited the seven summits what was his ambitions what did he want to do and everything mm-hmm. which brought me to the idea of you know going to the polls and everything and i realized that that's what i need to do against all advice obviously like you know and, and i agree with the advice i mean it was too much too soon Hmm. But I'm just the way. Was I'm, it hard for you to do that uh, that trip? It was very hard, but it was cathartic in a way because it was this is the only way I, you know, then at least I knew how to process things. Like I just wanted to throw myself in the deep end. Did you need the solitude of that kind of trip? I needed the solitude, knowing that the solitude would be the hardest thing for me. It was traumatic, in some ways. Like I mean, I would sometimes be, you know, like have tears rushing down my cheeks as I was, you know. Um, you know, pulling that sled and sometimes euphoria. And then sometimes it was just my... You were grieving. You were going through all the process. Yeah. And I don't know if this is a flaw or like, it's, you know, something I need to learn over the years or something, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm better when I'm, you know, in the deep end, when there's more at stake, when much more is asked of me. Um, when life becomes a bit more comfortable and stable and so on, I actually underperform than the average. Well, what's next for you, Ahmad? What are you What are you thinking of uh, when the world opens up again? Actually, I, I, it's a really good question. I, I really don't have an answer for you. I'm um, in some ways, I think I'm uh, lost in a way. I mean, um, uh, maybe in a, in a good sense of the word. I think you know everything that's happened has forced me to reevaluate things, how I've been living my life, the pace that I've been going. Um, as far as adventures, I, I think I've, I've taken quite a long hiatus. I mean, since the since the uh, ocean crossing and then subsequently in the summer of 2018, I went on this sort of two-week uh, moon analog mission. I mean, I, well, the question that I keep asking myself is sort of like, you know, um, I, this is a unique time in my life where I haven't had something larger than life ahead of me to work towards. Um, and so I go through a period where I feel like you know, is that era sort of, um, you know, behind me now? Or am I going through a hiatus? Am mm, I just mm. processing? Because I've been through so many changes yeah. in the past years. For one thing, I think, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great, you know, it's a great thing to aspire to is all these adventures, all these things have allowed me throughout all these years to still keep that boy in me alive. Um, and I think it's so important. And I think for, for you know, in the case of, uh, you know, obviously a woman, it's the girl inside her. But I think, you know, hanging on to that is so important and a lot of us lose it and some of us lose it so early on in our lives. Um, and I've done a reasonably good job of, of keeping that. That's and interesting. I, and I'd love to keep, yeah. it, keep it that yeah. way. I want to thank Ahmad for being my final guest of season one and for being so generous with his time and open with his answers. I particularly want to wish him all the best on the next phase of his journey and especially to congratulate him on his upcoming marriage. We are nearing the end of our first season and for our final episode, the tables are being turned on me. I'll be in the hot seat answering the questions I've been putting to my guests all season and talking about the pivots and shifts in my own life. Thanks a lot for listening today. This episode of What I Did Next has been brought to you by ANT Media with me, Malak Fuad, and is co-produced by Shirag Desai. I love hearing from you, so please connect with us on Instagram by searching for What I Did Next. We hope to see you next time.